Happy 10th birthday, Scold World Forum. Wow. Talk about accelerating the scale of transformational change. It's incredible to think that only 10 years ago, the movement that we've come to know as social entrepreneurship has captured the hearts and the minds of so many. And is best epitomized by the numbers of emails we get on a daily basis from around the world seeking an invitation to this forum. We are the most popular people from January to March. <laughs> it seems as if we're all part of this great entrepreneuring movement, whether we've founded and grown our own social ventures or are working to change systems and practices from within government, business, nonprofits, and even an 800-year-old university, which shall remain nameless. And as we shall see in a few minutes, members of royalty as well can be highly entrepreneurial. The point is, the notion of social entrepreneurship has expanded exponentially from those we call practitioners, the visionary entrepreneurs the Skull World Forum celebrates through its annual awards ceremony at Oxford, to becoming a massive movement that encompasses a wider community of entrepreneuring individuals who are carrying out a broad set of actions aimed at changing for the better the systems and practices in their own institutions. This is hugely welcome. In the year 2000, I was part of a new breed of organizations that identified and celebrated social entrepreneurs. At the time, identifying people or identifying those kinds of people was extremely important. Nobody knew what a social entrepreneur looked like or was. And as we elevated these men and women to the global stage, we were inspired and passionately wanted to be like them. All of a sudden, it seemed as if everyone was calling him or herself a social entrepreneur. And it led me, rather unfairly perhaps, to always be a little bit suspect of people who introduced themselves as, I'm a social entrepreneur. I knew from working with them how wonderfully unreasonable they could actually be. And actually, I thanked my lucky stars that the good Lord had seen it in her wisdom not to put more of those kinds of people on the face of the earth. <laughs> in sum, most of us are not social entrepreneurs who set up their own systems-changing ventures, but we can be entrepreneuring disruptors from wherever we are. And that is why this movement is growing at such a fast pace. To underscore the spectrum of where these entrepreneuring disruptors are coming from, this morning's plenary is going to showcase individuals who've chosen to drive change from different sectors, including government, foundations, universities, and social ventures. It has not been easy for any of them. It never is easy for disruptors. The vast majority of us cling to the known, to the familiar, no matter how unsatisfactory that is. The devil you know is better than the one that you don't. To kickstart our parade of disruptors, who better to call upon than His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales? Not even 10 years ago, the prince was regarded lovingly by most as, as an eccentric who spent his waking hours advocating for global environmental sustainability when very few of us really understood what that meant. Today, he is considered to be a visionary who long before it became imperative to do so, advocated for the need to focus on the long term and build businesses that brought together financial and social goals. He was with us at the very first Skull World Forum 10 years ago. And back in Oxford at the Said Business School in early February to open our new West Wing. We are most honored to begin this plenary session with a video message from one of the most distinguished disruptors we could imagine, the Prince of Wales. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm delighted to have to have been asked to say a few words at this 10th Skull World Forum on uh, social ent entrepreneurship. And uh, I'm only sorry not to be able to join you in person. Having been asked to speak at the first forum nearly a decade ago, I have been fascinated to discover how your efforts have gone from strength to strength. And if I may say so, uh, represent a real beacon of hope by demonstrating how business can be done differently. Now, I firmly believe that there are great opportunities for further and better learning between those entrepreneurs who run their businesses responsibly and sustainably and those social entrepreneurs whose focus is on social impact. The Skoll World Forum is a powerful mechanism for doing just this. For one thing, you are demonstrating that there is not necessarily a choice between either doing good business or meeting social and environmental goals. In fact, you have gone further than that by showing how a successful enterprise can benefit from the effective integration of social and natural capital into business planning. You are proving it can improve profits. Social entrepreneurs, for example, are demonstrating how it makes business sense to promote better public health, uh, uphold human rights, increase access to education, uh, amplify the voices of those most in need, and conserve resources. Of course, this approach goes squarely against the predominant assumptions of our day. So it really is one of the most interesting developments of our age. I must say that the need for these sorts of new and responsible business models has never been greater. Thankfully, nothing breeds success like success. And I'm convinced that if more people were made aware of the successful business models that take a sustainable approach, and if, as is increasingly the case, customers were uh, encouraged to place more value on what were previously seen as fringe questions, then we would get closer to achieving the critical paradigm shift the world so desperately needs. Unfortunately, seizing this opportunity is not a straightforward matter. I know, to my cost, how hard it is to persuade organisations to think in this different way. I've long championed responsible business and social enterprise, for instance. In one way or another, the work of my 15 charities incorporates social enterprise. Time and again, they have shown that if your focus is the, is the long term, is on the long term, you can create immensely profitable businesses, all by tapping into the vast potential of our social capital. Just one of my charities, the um, Prince's Trust, serves as a good example. Since 1976, it has helped more than 700,000 young people find their way into work, education or training. Many have gone on to set up businesses with my trust's help and are now employers themselves. The Prince's Initiative for Mature Enterprise, or PRIME, does much the same for older people by tapping into what society seems all too ready to cast off. Uh, a range of, of, of experience and knowledge gained over many years in work. Again, out of that has come an encouraging range of new businesses. Having proved through real-world experience that a more joined-up approach can work in practice, surely the task now is to scale up these schemes. And although the present economic difficulties, difficulties tend to discourage the adoption of new business models, if you think about it, this could be exactly the right moment to harness different approaches. After all, we certainly need new strategies that reflect the fact that natural resources are becoming depleted or that the environment is changing, that poverty is becoming more widespread and acute or that trends in global economics are leading to more social exclusion. And all of this is set against the sobering fact that the world's population increases by about 80 million people per year. How sustainable at the end of the day is that? Combining hard-headed business skills with the increasingly pressing 
job of embedding genuinely sustainable development into our economic model is, it seems to me, at the very top of the to-do list. Fortunately, social innovators have demonstrated through practical action that achieving business success by meeting social needs is not a pipe dream. It is an opportunity that entrepreneurs around the world are already embracing. Having um, proved the concept, the moment is surely right to spread ideas more widely, to scale up new ways of doing business and thereby harness the power of enterprise to benefit society, to sustain the natural environment and uh, benefit the financial bottom line. So, ladies and, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I can only wish you well for your annual forum and I very much look forward to being inspired by your work in the coming decade and beyond. Our next two disruptors are women, of course. I can remember meeting Jacqueline Novogratz when she was at the Rockefeller Foundation. And I had just started up at the Schwab Foundation. And as she excitedly described um, her vision for an organization that was going to invest philanthropic funding in creating market-based solutions to poverty, I remember thinking, gee, I wonder how that's going to work. Well, today we know very well how it works and only wish that there were more acumens in the world. And if Jacqueline cracked the code on how you can get certainly some kind of behavioral change among philanthropists, Molly Melching, who follows right after Jacqueline, certainly cracked the code on changing social norms, beginning in Senegal and today reaching over 6,000 communities in seven African countries. But as she's going to emphasize, the instruments of enduring change are the social networks in those communities. Molly's marvelous story is now available for all to read in Annie Malloy's However Long the Night, a book published by HarperCollins with the support of the Skoll Foundation. I'm delighted to welcome our disruptors. First Jacqueline, then Molly. So, as I've been walking around Oxford and talking to you here, it's no, no surprise that I would be overwhelmed by the swirl of optimism for who better than the social entrepreneurs to imagine that they can make the impossible possible and then go out and do it. And yet I've also been really struck by a growing sense of wariness and weariness in so many of us who say, yes, we're seeing this interconnectedness, this global community coming together, and at the same time, we also see in our communities people pulling back into comfortable tribe and to na clinging to narrow ideology, and, and, and we're feeling the sickening gap rising between wealthy and poor. And the truth is, we're starting to ask ourselves, what will it take to keep the center whole? Will it even hold? We have no choice but to decide that it will hold and to be the ones that go forth and do it, and that's really what leadership is all about, and that is why you are in the room today. The good news is we've all been part of this journey and we will continue. My journey with Acumen started in 2001, so 12 years ago. And at the time we had this idea, as Pamela said, that we would look at this notion that there could be a different kind of capital, patient capital, that would be backed by philanthropy and allow us to invest in entrepreneurs that would dare to go where markets had failed and aid had fallen short, and that would go on a journey with them for a long time, support them with technical assistance, and measure what we could in terms of impact, as well as financial returns. There were no road, road maps at the time, and we actually um, just decided that the best we could do was start and let the work teach us. What we did have was a compass. What we did have was a North Star direction that at the end of the day, if we started with trying to solve problems of poverty from the perspective of poor as people who wanted to say, change their own lives, maybe we could find ways to use capital to enable entrepreneurs to serve them better. We decided to jump into the questions, go deeper and deeper. Some of those first questions were really pretty basic. 
could the companies ever sustain? Would they ever scale to a point where they would even disrupt? I remember being at a meeting when I was talking about this new investment we had made in 1298, an ambulance company. And it had nine ambulances and the audacity to take on the bloated, broken bureaucracy in Indian emergency services. And after my talk, not surprisingly, I was confronted by a few businessmen who came up to me and, and explained to me that we were on a fool's errand and so was the company that nine ambulances wouldn't even be able to serve Mumbai, which was a city of 17 million people, um, which was a good point to, for them to think about. What that they didn't understand was that Shafi Mathur, Sweat and Mangal, their team, had the courage and the leadership to fight complacency and bureaucracy and corruption. And today that company has 1,000 ambulances, 5,000 employees, served 2 million people, and is now the model for how we deliver emergency services to all people, not only across South Asia, but now moving into other territories. Thank you. And as we started to succeed a little bit, the questions, of course, became deeper, and we saw that we needed more than capital in building particularly early stage companies. We were lucky to meet uh, Sam Goldman and Ned Tozen, um, who started D-Light, a solar company. And we worked with them because they had, again, the, the, the humility to see the world as it was. 1.5 billion people who had no access to electricity and were consigned to expensive, dirty kerosene, and the audacity to imagine it as it could be, that they were going to find a way to create a solar product that people valued and could afford and they were going to change the game. It's true we invested about $2 million in equity in this company, but we also supported them with time, helping them to think through some of the critical issues at the beginning, and also six full-time Acumen Fellows over the years, working on issues like how do you price when there is no market, distribution, how do you expand effectively and geographically. And now D-Light is selling 200,000 units a month by the end of the year, they will have brought light to 20 million people, and they are on track to bring light, solar light, to 100 million low-income people around the world by 2020. That makes a dent. You guys can't keep clapping because I'm on a time clock. <laughs> but thank you. Actually, I'm not going to share. There are so many successes I would love to share because I'm so proud of these guys. Um, but we also, in this journey, as I know so many of you did, hit those roadblocks where, where we were confronted with the real issues, the leadership questions of how does capital work and how do we really balance the values of accountability, yes, but also generosity. And I remember one night when we were trying to make a decision as to whether we would make a bridge loan to one of our companies that was working with 3,500 smallholder farmers, buying their goods with cash when they only had 10 days left of cash on their books. So do we kill the company now because we don't think it's going to work? Or do we hope that it does work and know that we can at least pay these farmers and not have to make them confront the fact that there will be no tom tomorrow otherwise? And we decided that we were going to control capital rather than let it control us. We made the, the bridge loan. Luckily, the company is still there. Um, it's a bet. It's from a compass. And we learned a lot about failure, our own and in the sector. Um, some were easier than others. One kind of failure is um, that came from a, a time that we encouraged an entrepreneur who had a fairly good model for delivering health services to the middle class or lower middle class. And we encouraged him to try to navigate and move it down so that he could work with really low income communities. What we underestimated was what we talked about last night, the persistence, the, the understanding how hard, eye-scratchingly hard it can be. And we didn't understand that the entrepreneur did not have the kind of will that we hoped he had, and so ended up writing off that investment. The most painful kinds of failures are when we find corruption in our companies and have to exit. And we are reminded when that happens that corruption is not good for any of us, worst of all, for the poor. Sometimes failures are good, like Gro Brundlin said last night. Um, we sometimes invest in companies not knowing how early they are on the innovation curve. And in this case, it was an early stage micro health insurance company in Pakistan, the first in the country's history. 
and the company didn't succeed, and we had to write down part of our investment. But now there are all these other companies that are building an industry based on many of the learnings. And if we don't take the risk to fail and learn at the edge, we will not innovate in the way that we need to for the poor. So over the past 12 years, we've watched ourselves grow up and grow, and we've learned a lot. We've seen that patient capital does work, investing $85 million in 75 companies and seeing 100 million people getting access to services. It's breathtaking, almost 60,000 jobs and $400 million coming into those companies. And all around us, we've seen a whole industry burgeoning. It's frothy and it's noisy and it's thrilling. JP Morgan um, estimates that we will see a trillion dollars going into impact investing in one form or another over the next 20 years, which is heady in and of itself. My worry and the risk is that as new funds come in, people are tempted to overpromise on the kinds of outsized financial and social returns we can get simultaneously. And I don't think that's possible, and we need to have more realistic and honest conversations. So the question for me, then, is a question of leadership. And how do we continue to push ourselves to ask the questions? We started off, each of us, doing what we're doing, building tools so that we could help on this journey to end poverty. And yet, at the same time, what are the next set of questions? How do we think about the tools that we each have, and how do they interact with philanthropy, with government, with the private markets? How do we ensure that we are driven with seeing investment as a means, not as an end in and of itself? And most importantly, how do we build an economy and a society in which we measure the things that we most cherish and honor, not just the things that we can count? That's our generation's challenge. And so I would say, if our first chapter, as metaphor, the Skull's first 10 years was about experimentation, while we must continue that spirit of experimentation and innovation, our next chapter has to be a chapter about a new kind of leadership, a difficult kind of leadership. I dare say that leadership is harder than entrepreneurship, but if you are a social entrepreneur or in this space, you have to be entrepreneurial and you have to be a leader. And that is bone-crushingly exhausting at times. That is the hard road. That is why it is so exciting that we have this journey to take together. As Chinua Achebe says, leadership is a sacred trust. We are expected to push the boundaries and to ask the hard questions. And I would say that it also requires a spiritual grounding, this courage to look inside at our own internal fears and our external resentments, this idea that we truly are connected to each other, we see it all around us every day, and that what we need from each other is this ethos, this African ethos that I am because you are, and that we move from that place. And it's really with this understanding at Acumen that so many of the decisions that we have to make and so many of the mistakes that we've made and also the successes that we have have come partially from getting the technicalities right and solving the technical problems, but mostly because we've got to be better, stronger with our judgment, with our wisdom as leaders. And so we took it upon ourselves to try to write a manifesto. We knew that it was an aspirational document, document one in which we would be pushed to be better than we think we are. And I've been carrying it around in my own pocket um, and reminded of my own shortcomings, but wanting to strive to be different. And so I thought I would share it with you, although we're not making it public to our larger community until next week. But as Jeff said last night, here at Skoll, I'm home. We're home. And so I would just ask that you don't put it on Twitter or Facebook. Um, and when I read it, if you would indulge me, we wrote it for Acumen, and at the same time, we wrote it for the kind of leadership we hope to see in the world. And I hope that it resonates with you. It starts by standing with the poor, listening to voices unheard, and recognizing potential where others see despair. It demands investing as a means, not an end, daring to go where markets have failed and aid has fallen short. It makes capital work for us, not control us. It thrives on moral imagination, the humility to see the world as it is, 
and the audacity that, to imagine the world as it could be. It's having the ambition to learn at the edge, the wisdom to admit failure, the courage to start again. It requires patience and kindness, resilience and grit, a hard-edged hope. It's leadership that rejects complacency, breaks through bureaucracy, challenges corruption, and does what's right, not what's easy. It's the radical idea of creating hope in a cynical world, changing the way the world tackles poverty, and building a, base, a world based on dignity. Thank you. Thank you. It, it all comes down to dignity, and I was lucky to be in Kenya recently where I got to sit in this hut with a woman named Terezia, Granny, and David Small, the, the regional distributor of D-Light. And we were talking to her about her light. And it was easy when she was talking about what she loved about it. And then I said, well, Terezia, how would you recommend that, that D-Light improve the product? And she put her hands on her um, hips, and she said, well, and she started with um, her first suggestion, which was to make the, the battery charge while the cell phone charged simultaneously. And we thought she was done. And then she was like, and my second point is, and she moved on from that. And I was watching her talk to David and him listen to her. And I thought, this is why I started doing this work. Because what I am witnessing is a conversation between equals. She is neither pandering nor is she begging. He is not standing there with a sense of certainty nor false benevolence. They are listening to each other, and in that interaction, they have the chance to transform each other. We are each other's destiny. And it is to each of us to work on what we work on in the best way we can to bring our whole selves to it, to ask the hard questions, and to build the world where we truly can extend dignity to all people. It starts with us, and there's no better community to do it. So thank you, and Godspeed to all of you. Salam alaikum. Good morning, everyone. On July 31st, 1997, 35 women from the village of Mali Kundabambra in Senegal, West Africa, publicly announced their decision to end a centuries-old tradition, that of female genital cutting. This was reported on television, radio, and newspapers throughout Senegal and internationally. Their decision came after they had participated in a three-year empowering education program that was implemented by Tosan and in which they learned their human rights for the very first time. They learned about their right to health. They learned about the right to be protected from all forms of violence and they also learned about their right, perhaps most importantly, to speak out, to voice their opinions, even the most controversial ones, like the one they made on July 31st. But reaction to this declaration was totally unexpected by all of us. Relatives and other community members from the Bambara ethnic group in the area in where they lived were outraged. And they felt very betrayed because these women who had dared not only to question but publicly, publicly renounce a tradition they all shared, an established group norm that had lasted for centuries. The action led to disruption of the social harmony and trust of the entire extended network. It was a very painful and a very difficult time for the women they faced the consequences afterwards and really suffered from it. Fortunately, the wisdom of an elder religious leader from a nearby village named Dimba Jaura enabled us to understand why this reaction was so incredibly hostile. Dimba had a brilliant insight. He explained that disruption did not come from the women's decision to end this practice, but rather from the process that they had used to abandon it. Because female genital cutting is a social norm which involves shared expectations of compliance by all members of the social group and carries very harsh sanctions if not followed, one individual, one family, one community 
could never abandon this practice alone without facing the anger, the condemnation, and marginalization from all the other members of the social network to which they belong. But Dimba had a solution. If new and trustworthy information is spread by the people themselves and discussed with the rest of the social network, including all those who really matter the most to them, then a disruption of the practice would be possible without disrupting the social cohesion of the community and the extended family. The disrupted practice could then be considered a positive disruption. One village is not enough, Dimba declared. It takes a whole social network to change behavior. He then walked from village to village to inform and dialogue with his interconnected group. He brought everyone together to announce a collective decision to end a practice which he had learned does not lead to health and well-being in the community. On February 14, 1998, the women, men, and children of the 13 villages in his social network came together to abandon their practice. It was the first collective declaration of FGC in Africa. Since that time, more than 5,000 communities across Senegal have declared the end to FGC using this same model. The movement, yes. The movement continues to accelerate, and we believe that within three years, Senegal could be the first African country to be FGC free. Now, many of us here are working on issues that require behavior change. And we all know that this is hard. Imagine when the behavior change is rooted in deeply entrenched social norms. It's even harder. Often, the consequences of efforts to disrupt a, a, an existing social practice can lead to anger, resistance, defensiveness, and worse, total blockage of any initiative towards change. Disruption, disruption is often necessary, yes. But instead of being aggressive and confrontational, the disruption can be organized from within and respectful. And everyone then becomes involved and engaged. And it can be then much more effective and much more sustainable. In fact, once a critical mass is reached, the change will no longer even be viewed as a disruption, but it will become a new social norm. Dimma's strategy, he was so intelligent, was to reach out to the most conservative religious and traditional leaders and tell them that they were going to be the new leaders of this movement for change. And they were honored because of this, and most of them happily accepted. Now, this does not mean that Dimba or other community change leaders did not have difficulties. It was not an easy time. To the contrary, these are controversial issues, and in the beginning, there was often much confrontation. But by combining courage and patience and perseverance, and above all, a broader framework of deep respect, they succeeded. Now, in Tostan's case, the strategy involves something that we now call organized diffusion. It starts in the classroom, where there's lots of dialogue and for a long period of time. Again, these classes last for three years. After each class, the participants go home and they share their knowledge with a co-wife, a friend, their husband, a religious leader. Then, the class itself organizes community events and they share all the information they have learned with everyone else in the community. And again, there is lots of discussion. After this, some of the most involved and engaged community members and participants of the class come together. These are five women from different villages who decided to go to 148 villages to talk to their relatives and help them to decide to abandon the practice of female genital cutting and child marriage. And this represents their social network. They went to so many of these villages 
and were successful in leading the villages to public declaration for the abandonment of that practice. Then there are inter-village meetings where people come together, all the villages that have been contacted, and they discuss what they want to do, what decisions they want to make, and how they're going to do it. And many, and most actually, then organize public declarations where all of the villagers come together, all the representatives, uh, they decide together to abandon, they announce this abandonment in front of the government officials, in front of all the invited guests, UN agencies, NGOs, and it's a very joyful and positive ceremony. We have discovered that this strategy to change deeply entrenched social norms proposed by Demba Jawa in 1997 can also be used um, for many other social norms that can often significantly hinder efforts in development, such as in education, in health, in the environment, in governance, and in economic growth. One example that is totally different from FGC is in the field of education. Tostan is now piloting a new module on positive parental practices, which we believe will help to better prepare infants in rural Senegal for more successful learning in schools. Now this is critical because education results in Senegal are truly dismal. Indeed, a recent evaluation of levels of reading among girls and boys in Senegal, throughout Senegal, in the formal school, revealed that after three years of primary schooling, only 7% of girls and 11% of boys had attained a minimum reading level. Now this is despite decades of teacher training, curriculum reform, and construction of school buildings throughout Senegal. This report stunned us, and we realized that perhaps out-of-the-box solutions were necessary. After a year of participatory research in Senegal, Tostan discovered that one such solution may reside in uncovering deeply entrenched social norms surrounding parenting practices, which actually prohibit mothers and fathers from engaging in learning in interactions with their young children. Many parents, particularly in rural areas, believe that it is best not to talk to their babies not to talk to their young children, to show atten too much attention to them, because they are actually protecting their children from spirits or other forces that they believe will harm these young children and ta even take them away. They also are not aware that the most important period for brain development occurs between zero and three years old and can be greatly stimulated by child the child's caretakers. But again, providing information to class members on brain development and the importance of looking at, interacting with, and stimulating learning in the infant is not enough to change behavior, as we learned before. Because any parent who attempted to enact new parenting practices on their own, alone, would be stopped by other family members. Often the mother-in-law would come and say, no, no, don't look in the baby's eyes. No, you can't do this, this is dangerous. Uh, no, you know, don't talk to a baby, this, is, this, this is, could be very dangerous. And so they do stop. And the new information thus needs to be sp spread and shared throughout this whole social network, through the organized diffusion strategy, so that everyone, the mother-in-laws, the other families, the the grandparents, the, the, the other children who take care of the young, the young babies and children, that they're all talking to, they're all playing with and actively stimulating the baby and child at all opportunities and throughout the day. Through using this strategy, newly literate parents who went through the Tostan program and then went through this other module on parenting, they have started to talk to and interact and read African traditional stories and other storybooks to their children on a regular basis. And they are joyfully surprised when they realize that even the youngest children are able to read these books in their mother tongue, of course, 
as we shall see in this short video film, which was taken on a cell phone in a remote rural community in Senegal, where reading books was not at all a common practice. No one did. The jubilant reaction you will see here when a four-year-old can fluently read in his mother tongue in Mandenka is a testament of the community's wholehearted embrace of positive disruption that has come from within. <laughs> Jacqueline and Molly have transformed philanthropy and uh, social norms, respectively. Our next two speakers could not be more different, highlighting that disruptors can be musicians and government ministers. Adrian and Antoine will change your concept of what it takes to be an exceptional violinist, and Marina Silva will challenge your thinking about what is possible in the public sector. Marina grew up as one of 11 children in a community of rubber tappers in Brazil's state of Acre. She was the first rubber tapper to be elected to Brazil's federal senate. President Lula appointed her as environment minister in 2003. And during that five years in that position, she reinforced her reputation as a tough advocate for the environment. She has since continued to challenge the status quo, coming in third in the last presidential election and launching this year the Sustainability Party. I'm only sorry that I can't vote for her. Marina will be followed by Adrian Anantawan. Adrian began studying violin at the age of nine and rapidly proved to be a gifted musician. Although he is only 27 years of age, he's already garnered a host of awards and degrees from different universities, some of the world's leading universities and institutes of music. But Adrian is not just another brilliant musician, as you will soon find out. He will defy your sense of what humans can accomplish, underscoring our limitless possibilities that when we apply creativity, tenacity, and positive energy, anything is possible. So please welcome Marina. Bom dia a todos. E agradeço a Deus pela oportunidade de poder compartilhar um pouco de nossa experiência no Brasil. Eu sou de uma geração que lutou contra a ditadura militar e que influenciou profundamente seu processo de redemocratização. Na Amazônia, essa mesma geração de pessoas aprendeu com o líder sindicalista e ambientalista Chico Mendes é, uma espécie de luta pacífica em defesa da floresta e das populações que habitam nessa floresta. Aprendemos também com a teologia da libertação da América Latina, a luta em defesa das pessoas mais frágeis, 
em situação de pobreza, sobretudo numa situação grave de fragilidade social, como a que acontecia na sociedade brasileira na segunda metade do século passado. É a combinação dessas duas lutas criou, na realidade do Brasil, o que costumamos chamar de socioambientalismo, que é a junção não é, da luta em defesa da floresta e dos graves problemas sociais. Essa luta une o direito das populações locais, dos extrativistas, que são os ribeirinhos, é, os quilombolas e as populações de indígenas, né, com a defesa da biodiversidade e os direitos né, democráticos que são tão importantes na nossa sociedade. O meu envolvimento com essas causas sempre foi um envolvimento visceral, já que até os 16 anos fiquei na floresta amazônica, é, acompanhei de perto a luta pacífica dos sindicalistas Chico Mendes, que eram os empates em defesa das florestas, em que mulheres, crianças e idosos faziam uma espécie de barreira humana para proteger a floresta do desmatamento. Esses empates, eles evitaram a destruição é, de milhares e milhares é, de, enfim, de hectares é, de floresta, mas, infelizmente, não foram suficientes para impedir o assassinato do líder seringueiro Chico Mendes, bem como o de outras lideranças que, na mesma época, foram igualmente assassinadas. Mas, desde a morte do Chico Mendes, a luta em defesa da Amazônia, na realidade do Brasil, ganhou grande visibilidade e algumas conquistas muito importantes, como foi o caso da criação das reservas extrativistas, que combina né, a proteção da biodiversidade e a permanência dessas comunidades nas áreas que tradicionalmente ocupam. Em 2003, com a chegada do presidente Lula ao governo, eu tive a honra de ser ministra do Meio Ambiente até meados de 2008, é, onde tivemos que enfrentar uma situação dramática que foi é, o aumento do desmatamento indo para 28 mil quilômetros quadrados. Né? O maior desmatamento da Amazônia tinha sido, em 95 com cerca de 29 mil quilômetros quadrados. Fizemos um esforço muito grande para enfrentar essa situação, é, enfim, buscando coerência com aquilo que exigia a sociedade de nós e, ao mesmo tempo, preservando a nossa origem de luta de defesa da Amazônia. Fizemos um esforço para transformar em políticas públicas as boas ideias, reunindo as experiências das organizações da sociedade civil, das ONGs, formulações e estudos da academia, iniciativas do empresariado comprometido com a transformação, né? e, ao mesmo tempo, né? fizemos um esforço para criar novas estruturas né? coerentes com essa nova abordagem. Não bastava termos uma boa ideia, era preciso criar os novos processos e as novas estruturas. O educador francês Edgar Morin, ele disse que, no começo, a mudança é apenas um pequeno desvio e que a gente tem que ficar atento para verificar quais são os desvios que a gente quer ajudar a prosperar. Na realidade do Brasil, nós procuramos e encontramos esses bons desvios, né? chegamos a produzir uma visão e é, com a ideia de que a abordagem para enfrentar o desmatamento da Amazônia precisava ser uma política transversal, nós partimos para criar essa nova estrutura e esses novos processos. Foi assim que surgiu o Plano de Prevenção e Controle do Desmatamento da Amazônia, que é, chegamos né, a combater os crimes ambientais utilizando dois processos combinados. Imagens de satélite, que faziam toda a cobertura das ações ilegais, né, orientando as ações de fiscalização e repressão. 
A fiscalização era feita pelo órgão ambiental federal e a repressão era feita pela própria Polícia Federal. É, nós, com esse esforço, conseguimos desmontar verdadeiras quadrilhas que contavam com a participação de empresas não é, e de pessoas dentro da própria estrutura do governo. E o certo é que, combinando essa ação de repressão com a criação de unidades de conservação, porque criamos cerca de 200 mil quilômetros quadrados de novas unidades de conservação, além de criar cerca de 100 mil quilômetros quadrados de terras indígenas para as populações tradicionais. Criamos novos regramentos legais, como a Lei de Gestão de Florestas Públicas, é, o Instituto Chico Mendes de Conservação da Biodiversidade, vedamos o crédito para todos os desmatadores ilegais, mas, lamentavelmente, não conseguimos, por parte do governo, o apoio necessário para uma política de fomento que nos levasse à mudança do modelo de exploração predatória da precária, que é a principal responsável na Amazônia pela perda de floresta. É, o enfrentamento que foi feito dos grandes lobbies econômicos, contrários às ações de combate ao desmatamento, não é? foi um sucesso, mas, infelizmente, seria necessário mais tempo, mais firmeza do governo em persistir nessa agenda. Mesmo assim, com todas as dificuldades, conseguimos uma redução de mais de 80% do desmatamento na realidade da Amazônia, evitando que cerca de 2 bilhões de toneladas é, de gás carbônico fossem emitidas, não é? aumentando aí o grave problema das mudanças climáticas. Não é? Esse plano, ele acumula hoje quase uma década de é, bons é, retornos, mas, é, infelizmente, ele agora está ameaçado pela mudança que aconteceu recentemente do Código Florestal. Além dessa mudança na lei que protege as florestas, nós tivemos né, uma mudança na lei de criação é, das unidades de conservação, tivemos uma mudança nas estruturas de fiscalização e há hoje no Congresso Nacional Brasileiro uma proposta para mudar também a lei que cria as terras indígenas. Como se não bastasse todos esses retrocessos que estão acontecendo, nós temos hoje não é, a anistia para os vários desmatadores que haviam sido combatidos no plano anterior. O certo é que hoje a governança ambiental brasileira está enfraquecida. E os grandes projetos que estão sendo feitos hoje no Brasil de infraestrutura, eles, além de não terem a qualidade social necessária, também eles não atendem às exigências ambientais necessárias. Não é? Mesmo assim, não é? nós identificamos na realidade do Brasil é, uma mudança significativa e um aumento na consciência ambiental da população brasileira. Nós temos hoje uma nova forma de militância, é, da mesma forma que está acontecendo em outras partes do mundo, um novo ativismo que reúne pessoas de um modo muito especial, que tem se constituído numa verdadeira esperança para todos nós que lutamos a favor do desenvolvimento sustentável. A essa nova forma de militância, eu dei um nome chamado de ativismo autoral, é, em contraposição ao que eu chamo de ativismo dirigido. O ativismo dirigido tem muito a ver com o que tínhamos anteriormente, que era a mobilização feita, sobretudo, por partidos políticos, por sindicatos ou por lideranças carismáticas. Nesse ativismo dirigido, a ação é sempre centrada não é, no constrangimento, na punição 
daqueles que estão fazendo a contravenção. Não é? E a instituição que está à frente do movimento é colocada como o condutor do processo e da ação das pessoas. É, além disso, né, a autoria e o reconhecimento das ações do ativismo dirigido, ele é sempre atribuído né, à organização e aos dirigentes ou à liderança carismática e tem também uma acentuada ênfase naquilo que chamo de hierarquia não é? É, e na disciplina. Não é? Quem viveu a experiência dos partidos políticos de esquerda sabe que é assim que acontece. É, no ativismo dirigido, é, esse ativismo antigo, paradoxalmente, ele tem uma propensão maior ao discurso em favor das causas coletivas e tem a desvantagem de colocar a maioria das pessoas no lugar de meros espectadores da política, não se colocando como sujeitos. Né? No ativismo autoral, essa nova forma que eu identifico está acontecendo no mundo, a ação se centra, em primeiro lugar, em convencer as pessoas, em envolver as pessoas, e não apenas no constrangimento e na punição. E mesmo quando há uma organização social, essa organização ela serve para dar suporte, para ser uma base e não estar à frente das pessoas ou atrás das pessoas como um sujeito oculto. O envolvimento se dá pelos vínculos e afinidades de forma horizontal, mas, sobretudo, pela busca de consensos não é, em espaços de convergência. Há no ativismo novo que surge no mundo, uma nova propensão para dividir a autoria, a realização e o reconhecimento das conquistas. O ativista autoral se envolve pelas causas, mas também não é, pelo prazer de experienciar não é, a part e participar de atividades criativas, produtivas e livres que levam à transformação da sociedade. Esse novo ativismo se viabiliza graças à revolução da comunicação em tempo real e das novas tecnologias. Ele é a e a principal vantagem dessa nova forma de ativismo não é? é conferir maior estímulo àquilo que eu chamo de exercício da militância disponível, não é? tirando as pessoas do lugar de espectadores da política para o lugar de autor, mobilizador e protagonista. A sua maior desvantagem é o risco de nos fragmentarmos, não é? de termos uma ação puramente individual, sem o que não há como se ter nenhum projeto coletivo de transformação. É, o nosso grande desafio nessa forma de ativivos, no, no meu entendimento, não é? é fazer a junção de dois movimentos que parecem contraditórios, que eu entendo serem complementares. É aquilo que eu chamo de juntar é, a agregação dispersiva e a dispersão agregadora. Na agregação dispersiva, que é um paradoxo, né, as pessoas se juntam através de valores não é, para ganhar a energia da transformação. Já na dispersão agregadora, as pessoas imantadas por essa energia transformadora, elas se espalham pelo mundo inteiro, criando aquilo que eu chamo de pontos gravitacionais. Esses é, pontos gravitacionais que se multiplicam, né, criando né, novas superfícies de sustentação para a profunda mudança que o mundo precisa na realidade econômica e social do nosso tempo. A diferença é que essa nova superfície não é uma infraestrutura física, econômica e social. Ela é uma nova base de valores. É mais que uma maneira de fazer as coisas. É uma maneira de ser, um ideal de vida. Geralmente, quando eu faço esse tipo de fala, né, as pessoas me perguntam se eu sou pessimista ou otimista. E eu sempre respondo que nem pessimista nem otimista. Tão somente persistente. 
E eu vejo que essa nova realidade, ela está aqui presente com a presença de todos vocês, é, criando essa nova força transformadora que, no meu entendimento, nos levará não a uma ruptura ou uma transição demorada, mas uma verdadeira mutação, uma mutação possibilitadora para a grande transformação que o mundo precisa na crise desse nosso tempo. Muito obrigada. tell you a story about our last speaker. About um, 15 years ago, I read about Richard Jefferson in The Economist. Um, and I picked up the phone and I called him in Australia, where he is based. Um, and I told him I needed him to apply to the Schwab Foundation um, because this was exactly, he was exactly the kind of person that we were looking for, for our community of outstanding social entrepreneurs. Well, Richard quickly told me that he was not a joiner of anything and that he had absolutely no interest whatsoever in anything that I was offering. Um, 
I continued to insist, and I even offered to actually write his entire application for him, <laughs> which is something I never do and never have done since. Anyway, he reluctantly agreed probably to get me off the phone, and so, of course, you know, I pieced together this application from, you know, looking up what he'd done and putting this whole thing together, et cetera, et cetera, and I sent it off to him. And a couple days later, um, I heard back from him, and he said, what you've written is total rubbish. <laughs> and he proceeded, of course, to fill out the whole thing, which is exactly what I wanted him to do in the first place. Um, at any rate, Richard is amazing. I will call him the chief disruptor of everything. And um, we're just wonderfully happy to have him here with us. And um, welcome, Richard Jefferson. Um, okay, what Pamela didn't tell you about, thanks Jeeves, um, what Pamela didn't tell you about was the real reason I got involved in the Schwab Foundation, and this is an object lesson in, in incentives. It turns out that I was quite refractory to all of her blandishments until she said, but on our board we've got, and it was Lord this and Sir this, and I thought, you know, and then she said, and Quincy Jones. <laughs> What? Q is on your board? And talk about bait and switch. She'd promised that she was going to introduce me to Quincy Jones, who was one of my role models as a student musician. And he never showed up to the board meetings. And every time I'd go to Davos, he'd always disappear smoking cigars with Bill Clinton, and I never hung with the Q. But it was well worth it anyway. Okay, well, as is typical of the Skoll events and other events of this ilk, uh, I have torn up all my notes, uh, literally. Uh, because I had dinner last night with a friend, uh, Judith Roden, from the Rockefeller Foundation, suddenly reminded me that, in fact, what I want to talk about is the big disruption, the elephant in the room, and we do have precedence for that. We have, uh, we have a way forward where we can say, yes, it has been done, it can be done again at an even bigger scale. So I am actually going to be talking a little bit about the giant elephant, the system that all of our heroes uh, bravely rage against. I mean, one of the things that has been a, a moving uh, event in my life is becoming involved with social enterprise because I discovered soon in my career I didn't actually have a tribe. Uh, the scientists, I was, I was a pretty good scientist, really, but I just didn't feel at home there because the reason I was doing science and the reason they were doing science, the incentives, the rewards, didn't really align. Then I got into the development industry and I thought I was gonna die. I said, this is definitely not for me. Uh, so there am I. Tribeless, and then I got this call. I feel like the Ziegfeld Follies lineup, right? And so Pamela calls me and says, "Well, you too could join." And I and I thought, "Yeah, right." And I remember my first meeting at the the foundation, um, and it was really like a 12-step program going in there and saying, "Hi, you know, I'm a molecular biologist," and they said, "Okay, good, okay, I'm gonna have a, have a cup of bad coffee," and. Uh, <laughs> And then I discovered the finest human beings I had ever known in my life, and I discovered I had a tribe. And it was a very, very uplifting experience, because to this day, they don't really know what I do, but they like that I do it. Uh, <laughs> so considering, considering the countdown timer is going to ensure that that doesn't change today, <laughs> I will make an open offer to any of you who want to hear much more about what I do, that if you buy me a drink, I will tell you uh, ad nauseum. Uh, literally, ad nauseum, <laughs> if you buy me the wrong kind of drink. Um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, the big system, the big dog that we, uh, we don't refer to very much, and we should, and that's the innovation system. Uh, if there are economists in the room, which seems a, a certainty, uh, what I'll be talking about is the enormous biological imperative that drives everything. We talk often and glibly about human rights, but the truth is all of those are follow-ons from a much more interesting and biological imperative. And I'm going to tell you a little story that brings this to the fore. Um, in November of 1960, a, uh, a young English woman, a secretarial college graduate, was sitting having lunch in a forest and noticing uh, her colleagues having lunch. And one of them, David, was eating termites. And she thought, <laughs> she thought, this is amazing. So she sent a telegram back to her uh, mentor. And that wouldn't be so remarkable, except that 
the woman was Jane Goodall. And the colleague she was watching was David Graybeard, a chimpanzee. And in So Eating Termites, he had constructed a tool. When Jane referred this back to Louis Leakey, her mentor, his response, which was comparably exciting and actually shattered the field of primatology and much of anthropology, was actually an object lesson about DNA, that in the DNA of primates, of us, is this imperative, not a right, not even an inclination, but an imperative to innovate, to envision, to create, to make, to use, and critically, to benefit from the use of a tool. That really is the descriptor of primates and of us. And since a common ancestor emerged uh, that gave rise to uh, David and ourselves, that has been the driver of the development of our civilizations, our societies, our institutions, uh, and their misfunctions, and their dysfunction now. As you can imagine, if there is a fundamental driver to solve problems, to have your own skin in the game, that driver is both a powerful reason to persist as a society, but it's also a powerful target for the dark side. If you want to control in a society, there is no better way to control than to suppress, harness, or completely uh, deny this fundamental imperative, the biological imperative of innovation. And that is what we developed. Over the last millennia, we have developed, on the one hand, with the good angel, the capability of inspiring and empowering innovation. For the first several thousand years, this was through exploration of the natural world, the space that we live in, through, through trade, through, through uh, innovation based on exploration. But latterly, this has been through the use of the most remarkable invention in the history of our species, which is science. The downside, the dark side of innovation is that in both of those activities, constraining this imperative to innovate has been a powerful tool for securing power, prestige, and privilege. And what I'll describe to you is that my real goal is to make social enterprise go away. We should have no more such meetings in 10 years because all enterprise should be intrinsically social or social capable. This should be an evanescent. <laughs> and it can be done. This is a huge, inexorable juggernaut of a system, and it can be changed. So let me describe one example in history where it has been. In fact, one should think that we all, all should be speaking Portuguese today if not for the Dutch. Okay, here's the, here's the story there. From the 1400s up to the late 1500s, uh, long-distance maritime commerce was dominated by the Portuguese and to some extent the Spanish. Mostly the Portuguese, it makes a better story. And um, they had mastered navigation, they had mastered cartography. They had sent over and over, they would send their explorers out to survey to find the features of the natural world, the, the seaways, the coasts, the reefs, the shoals, the currents, the continents, and to bring that knowledge back secretly where it could be assembled into decision support tools, maps. When they did this, and they maintained it very, very secretively, they alone were able to cyclically build on that knowledge until they knew how to get to the East and the West Indies and no one else did. The tool that was so important to them and so important to the future of civilization is the map. So think about the map for a minute. What is a map? You like to think of it as a map is something which tells you where to go, but it doesn't. It actually de-risks your choices. A map is not a direction where to go. It's a, a tool that allows you to lower the risk involved in your journey. If I give you a map of London, the tube map, for instance, it presupposes nothing about where you will go on your journey, but it is an essential tool for you to take that journey. The map is the ultimate tool of investment because it de-risks a process. Now, in 1595, something most remarkable happened. A Dutch merchant, traveler, I don't know what you'd call him back then, an entrepreneur named Jan Huygens van Linschoden was working for the Portuguese governor of Goa in India. And you know, this is very cinematic, I could imagine. Stumbling in the back rooms of the, of the governor's mansions, he discovered the entire lore of Portuguese cartography of 150 years of the surveys and maps and the portolans that indicated how to get between this strait and that strait and this shoal and that reef. And he did the logical, pragmatic Dutch thing. Well, that's repetitious. Uh, he copied them. <laughs> so he copied them, and then in a very Indiana Jones with, with wrecks, shipwrecks and deserts and bandits and everything, took him two years to get back to Amsterdam, where he did the totally non-Dutch thing. So instead of selling this treasure trove to a Dutch merchant house, he published it, open access. Now this was 
post-Gutenberg, so once you made the book, it was there. And it was before copyright, so no lawyers. So the year it was published, the year it was published, saw a stimulation of enterprise that had never happened in our history before. Before that, the Portuguese and Spanish had exercised a de facto Iberian monopoly over long-distance maritime commerce. The ships were slow and miserable. The navigation tools were pathetic. Um, investment tools were limited. Insurance was largely non-existent. And risk was high because all of the surveys were their own. 1596, when the Itinerario was published, the Dutch East India Company was formed. And the British East India Company was formed. Whew. So in one year, basically, the monopoly was destroyed. And over the next 50 years, a massive explosion of investment, of tools, of de-risking, of, of new types of ships and navigation. In fact, the world changed so dramatically because the commonality of the tools of de-risking innovation became a public good. Pretty soon, it became inexorable that maps would get better when the Dutch maps were added to the English maps, which were added to the Portuguese and the Spanish maps, and later the French and the Germans. And eventually, all maps were aggregated into a substantially accurate tool to de-risk the natural world. Here there be dragons was a matter of history. So that's the map. What happened after that? Science happened after that. Right around the time all this explosion was happening, Newton, over the road, was starting a revolution that has changed everything, absolutely everything. Whereas before, the human innovative spirit was discovering the value of place, where things are, you know, what is there. Everything that happened in science since the 1700s was really about how does it work? And passing through now the gamut not of place, but of what? How does the natural law of physics or of biology, how can it shape technology and the development of that? And interestingly enough, the biggest problem faced by those people was secrecy. How could someone who discovers a new process, invents a new spring, a new chronometer, how can they benefit from that? Well, traditionally, by manufacturing it themselves and not telling anyone. But there's a Latin word, patere, which has evolved into a very unusual institution, patents. That was invented by my illustrious forebear, Thomas Jefferson, in the United States in 1790, specifically, hey, <laughs> dad told me he was. Uh, uh, specifically to tease into public view these inventions. So he's making this begrudging compromise, saying, if you will simply tell us what you know, we will give you the right to benefit from it for a small amount of time. Now, what he did not anticipate was that an invention at that time was also a product, but that in 100 years, in the next 200 years, inventions, the iPhone, this cool thing, whatever it is, uh, will involve 1,000 pieces of technology. And this is in my last, last time. I'm going to give you, leave you with a vision of what can be done and what is being done. Envision a jigsaw puzzle. Now, most of you have children, and many of the rest of you were children. And when you were, <laughs> you assembled jigsaw puzzles. Now, jigsaw puzzles have four rules by which they must be, uh, must be undertaken. And these are the same four rules for making things, products, vaccines, crops, uh, iPhones, uh, fabrics, anything that you touch and see has passed through the same rules of jigsaws. First, don't lose the box. Don't lose the box. You have to be able to envision the product. You have to be able to envision this thing. You lose the box, you're screwed, okay? <laughs> Ever had someone hand you a baggie full of bits and say, make it? <laughs> oh, no. The other thing, you got to assume most of the pieces are there. Maybe 10% can go down the heater vent or the dog can eat them, but basically, if you're not reasonably confident when you pull this out of the bottom drawer that more or less the pieces are there, you don't set out to build this puzzle. So it's got to be reasonably comprehensive. You can color some in and have a few, few holes in there. Oh, that was Nemo. Uh, but it's OK. Rule three, rule three. Start from something you know. Everyone in innovation and everyone in jigsaw puzzles does that. We start in the corners and the edges. We all do. It's not cheating. It's OK. If somebody has left a bolus of jigsaw puzzle pieces together, oh, silly me, look at that. And you pop it down and you start from something you know. You all do it. The fourth rule, this is like Spanish Inquisition. The fourth rule is the comfy chairs. <laughs> The fourth rule is that it's OK. Don't despair. It's, they actually are supposed to fit together. Uh, there's only six or seven shapes in a jigsaw puzzle, not 1,000. If you have a huge jigsaw puzzle of 1,000 pieces, it's not 1,000 different shapes. It's a half a dozen. So don't despair. <laughs> or, or Douglas Adams would have something to say about that. Don't panic. 
The same is true with innovation. Now, in the last 200 years, what's happened from Thomas Jefferson's idea of the patent, where a mousetrap or a cotton gin merited a single document that it could exclude others, now virtually everything we aspire to do and everything we need to democratize in the use of science to make products and services has been fragmented fragmented like a jigsaw puzzle into thousands and thousands of pieces. This year, almost half a million patents were applied for in China alone. Each country now building this enormous, inexorable volume of no, because a patent is the right to sue, not the right to do. It doesn't actually give you any capability to make a thing. It only gives you a querying the pitch role. And this is a very, very substantial issue. If we want to democratize the use of science, what we have to do is create a global cyber infrastructure that allows all of us, not just lawyers, to begin to parse and understand and assemble maps like Van Linskoten basically enabled of worldwide cartography. So, I'm, hey, it has to stop moving uh, at zero. Um, <laughs> I was expecting there'd be this sort of negative thing that is like the likelihood of ever getting invited back. Um, so, so what I, I should have stuck with the notes. What I wanted to say was that 50 years ago, there was a precedent for modest, in, modest investment causing a massive disruption of what felt like an inexorable system, and that was the Green Revolution. Irrespective of whether you admire it or decry it, it was amongst the most powerful interventions ever made by philanthropy. A modest investment, there are probably a billion people alive now that would not have been alive had that investment not been made, but it was through the final issue. It was through enabling problem solving, a new type of problem solving. So if I have to leave, I, which I probably do because they turned it off, um, <laughs> it would be with this. The problem to solve is the problem of problem solving. It's not about making a new vaccine. It's not about making a new crop or a new surface or an iPhone. It's about figuring out how to enable a broader demographic of problem solvers. If we keep thinking that there will be experts of roughly my albedo fixing other people's problems, we're never going to get off the treadmill. We are never going to get away from celebrating the people who are champions in this inexorably wretched system. What we have to do is change the system to democratize the ability to access the best and brightest the, the capital tools, the de-risking tools, to convince investors that a little investment can yield an acceptable return because the risk is low. So our recommendation to you, and through the work we've done in developing the lens with investments initially from the Rockefeller Foundation, is that this could be Van Linskoten's revolution. It's time to bring the world of intellectual property and de-risking to become a digital public good where anyone, anywhere, in any language can work with anyone else to create a map of one port, of one domain, of solar cells, of vaccines, of rice plants that perform better in their paddock, and democratize the craft of problem solving. So what I have to leave you with, it's about the demographics of problem solving. If we want to not have this meeting in 10 years, we have to solve that by democratizing the ability of people to work together to de-risk the investment landscape and to de-risk the science-enabled innovation landscape. So innovation cartography. We've set out to do it in the last three or four years, and it's just been launched in the last uh, couple of months, in a soft launch, so don't kill our servers. But it's the beginning of that process. So I'm, I'm way overdone. Thank you very much. Time to get up and stretch your legs. We've come to the conclusion of uh, our disruptive plenary and hope you've been inspired and energized to continue to disrupt for social change wherever you are. And if you want more inspiration and more excitement, I promise we have a wonderful treat for you this evening at the awards ceremony. God bless.